Hello everybody, we are going to start with the seminar. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell you sorry for yesterday. We have unexpected uh, problems, technical issues that we don't understand why, but uh, I want to advise you if today we have the same problem, uh, we are going to follow with the seminar because at the end uh, we are going to be able to get the video of the seminar, okay? And you will find it in the internet and also in our YouTube channel, okay? Okay, we can start. Uh, today we have the seminar done by Nicola Perinka. He received his uh, Master in Printing Engineering and his PhD in Chemistry and Technology of Materials, both from the University of, of uh, Pardubay. His main research objective has been focused on formulation and printing of functional materials, as well as device fabrication. Okay, and today he is going to present the printed powder-based AC electroluminescence, its past and future challenges. Okay, Nico, you can you can start with the seminar. Thank you, Raquel, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody, again. Uh, so hopefully today we will be able to finish the presentation, and if not, uh, as Raquel said, you will have it available online. So. Uh, Again, to start, uh, I'm going to talk about printed powder based AC electroluminescence and uh, its past and future. Uh, to the content of the presentation, I will give you an introduction about my talk, then I will explain you what is the history of this technology. Uh, then I will talk about uh, how it works actually. And uh, more importantly, the materials which are used to construct such kind of devices. Uh, what are the current research developments in this field and uh, what we expect in future? So the introduction is uh, basically this talk is focused on the uh, survey of the of the history of this technology, which took uh, over 100 years. And uh, I will explain you the details about the materials which are employed in this uh, technology and uh, which are what, what are the most recent uh, research advances. And uh, also, last but not least, the outlooks uh, in future. Uh, so let's go to the history. The electroluminescence was first observed by the Captain uh, Henry Joseph Brown. Uh, you are not changing the, the slides. I don't see how the slides change. I don't know if you are not setting well this or, but we can only see the first slide. Okay. Okay. I will, I will try to, I will try to uh, uh, share the slide again. Let's see if it helps. Now you can see it. I, I yes now yes. Okay. okay, sorry. So you you uh, stopped here, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is the content which I already explained, and uh, this is just the illustration of the uh, the evolution of the technology, and now we are at the history. So the electroluminescence was first observed by the captain Henry Joseph Brown in uh, 1907 when he was actually testing different kind of uh, semiconductor crystals to construct the radio uh, detectors. And by accident, he uh, observed uh, yellow glowing when he contacted by DC current the crystal of silicon carbide, uh, also called as carborundum. And at that time, he actually didn't understand very well what was happening. Uh, he was he was thinking it was actually glowing by the by the heat which was generated generated by applying the current, but uh, that uh, observation gave uh, um, the base for the inv later invention of light emitting diode, which was first described by the Russian researcher Oleg Losev in 1927, and uh, then it took another few decades until 1962 
when the first uh, LED, as we know today, uh, with the visible light, was uh, constructed by the American researcher Nicolonia Jr. But in this talk, we are we are not going to talk about the light emitting diodes. We are going to talk about the powder electroluminescence, which is something else. But I just wanted to show you the connection between the two technologies that they have actually the same base. The AC electroluminescence itself uh, was reported first uh, by the French uh, researcher Georges Distro in 1936. And uh, his uh, first cell uh, was uh, constructed, as you can see on the right side of the slide. Uh, it was actually a tube filled with, uh, filled with uh, oil and uh, the zinc oxide, uh, which is the luminescent material, was deposited on one of the electrodes and he applied very high voltage of 15 kilowatts and observed quite poor uh, luminance. And um, there was actually no uh, transparent electrode at the time. After that, he modified uh, the cell. Uh, he made it more, uh, let's say, planar and he replaced the one of the electrodes by salt water and uh, to separate the the castrol oil which he used as a dielectric material he used uh, mica and then it took another more or less 20 years until uh, the technology was uh, let's say fully discovered and uh, ready to be transferred to the industry and uh, so in 1950s uh, there was a first concept of the flat light source, uh, which you can see on the on the right, and uh, the basic uh, structure of the of the that device was based on um, on the, again uh, zinc sulfide uh, doped with copper, and that was uh, dispersed in an organic binder, and uh, an important uh, improvement consisted in, a, in an application of a tin oxide uh, transparent electrode, which uh, permitted the, li the light to go out in the, over the whole area of the device. And like that, uh, let's say the first uh, flat source uh, thin film uh, device was, uh, was constructed. They applied uh, about 100 volts uh, AC current at 60 Hertz. And uh, at low um, luminance, the device could be stable over years. More problematic was to reach uh, high luminance levels, as I will also explain later. Uh, in 1960s, there was a first industrial application. At that time, actually, it was quite impressive uh, to see uh, such technology applied uh, in the car as you can see on the picture on the right. Um, however, uh, although being uh, very attractive visually, uh, the technology needed uh, the source of high voltage. In, the, in that case, it was 200 volt transformer. And uh, as you can imagine, at that time, the, the electronics was not so advanced and that technology was not very stable. And on the other hand, in 60s, uh, there were emerging another te lighting technology such as uh, LED or uh, fluorescent uh, lamps or uh, gas discharge, LCD crystal displays and so on. So actually this technology didn't last uh, for a long time and was rather replaced by others. Uh, in 1970s, there was another continuation uh, which was based on um, the application of uh, synfield transistors in combination is, with uh, phosphor-based uh, materials. But uh, in this case, we don't talk anymore about uh, the uh, powder-based electroluminescence, and the, the deposition of the luminescent layer was actually realized by other techniques, such as uh, atomic uh, layer epitaxy. And uh, this technology cannot be considered anymore as a, as a let's say, the powder electroluminescence, but was the, let's say, like the continuation of the of this technology uh, being more advanced, but uh, no more printed. Uh, also, 
as many of you may be familiar with, is the use of the backlight uh, uh, technology for the watch uh, to see the, 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 the hours uh, in the night. That is actually based on the, on the same concept. So what is the, the AC powder electroluminescence today? I think the most uh, recent developments are uh, uh, represented by the product portfolio of the company LightTape, uh, located in the United States. They are able to produce uh, tapes which are thin film and flexible. Uh, they provide different colors and they can reach up to 200 candelas per square meter and durability is extending 40,000 hours at actually very low power consumption of 0.4 to 1.1 watt per uh, linear meter at one inch width. So it's actually very attractive technology and uh, I can I can show you a video which they have on their web page, which is also quite impressive. So just give me a second to switch. Yes. We cannot see the video. Oh, you Try could. Again. Start again the video. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will start again. Okay. Uh, now you can see it. Uh, play it. Okay. Now can you see? Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. Uh, as you can see, I, it's it's quite impressive. Uh, however, still uh, there are some limitations as the the highest luminance, which I will discuss later. And more or less, I would say that this is the state of the art uh, product on the market related to this technology. So, uh, how does it actually work? The principle of uh, AC powder electroluminescence uh, light generation is based on uh, constant charging and discharging of uh, of a capacitor. Actually, the, the the device is capacitor, which uh, differentiates it from the light emitting diodes, which are based on a diode technology. In this case, the light is generation generated by the collision of uh, high energy electrons which are accelerated and hit, hitting the surface of the zinc uh, sulfide doped particles. Namely, they are uh, the luminescent centers, uh, which are subsequently excited to higher energy levels, followed by optical transition uh, of the excited energy levels. And that's what we observe as a, as a light. The device is based on a sandwich of uh, different layers 
first of all, there there is a, some substrate which can be rigid or transparent uh, and um, flexible. Then we have a transparent electrode, the layer of uh, the powder, which is uh, luminescent, usually called as phosphor, but I should stress that it doesn't have to do anything with phosphor because uh, the composition is uh, based uh, usually on uh, zinc sulfide or other compounds, as I will show later. There is no phosphor. The phosphor probably stands for uh, more as a phosphorescence. So this material is phosphored in an organic binder, then followed by dielectric layer and uh, the base electrodes and encapsulation, which is important to protect the device from outer impact. So what are the parameters to control? Uh, first of all, uh, the AC voltage is quite high. The minimum is around 60 watts and maximum around 250. It can be also a little bit lower or more, but this is like the most typical range. And the frequency of the AC current is um, modulated usually in the range of uh, 50 to 5000 or even more hertz were reported. The most typical frequency is around 500 hertz. The brightness uh, um, today, what is, um, let's say, available commercially is usually limited to 200 uh, candelas per square meter. But as I will show you later, some newer research advances were reporting higher levels. And the color uh, can be more or less modified uh, in the whole range, except of uh, red light and uh, white light. The problem is basically that uh, there is a lack of crystals emitting uh, a strong red light. So the red is not really red and usually needs to be um, complemented with some other uh, organic uh, uh, materials emitting in the red field. And they are usually less stable, which also complicates the, the construction of uh, white light devices. And the durability, thanks to the advances made over the last decades can go up to 40,000 hours as I as I explained uh, before. So what are the materials used to construct such kind of devices? Uh, first of all, the dielectric materials, which are very important as uh, the device is actually a capacitor. Um, to make it flexible, usually we need to combine uh, some polymer binders with uh, inorganic uh, crystal particles. The typical polymer binders can be polyvinyl fluoride or uh, thianoethylate cellulose or uh, many other binders. These, I think, are the, the first used, especially the thianoethyl cellulose, which have a uh, fair dielectric constant of 5 to 20. Uh, but to enhance the dielectric constant of the composite uh, material, which is at the end the layer of dielectric, is uh, combined with the crystals of, uh, of other inorganic oxides, as you can see. And the most typical material which is used uh, to, to make the dielectric layer is uh, uh, titanium barium, uh, sorry, the titanium oxide of uh, barium of barium and uh, usually the, the dielectric constant is significantly increased by uh, by applying this uh, composite of, of uh, this material with the polymer binders. So as the luminescent materials, uh, the most typical uh, material used uh, over many decades in this field is the zinc sulfide which contain uh, small per percentages of uh, dopants. Uh, most typically it's copper or chloride or uh, mangan, aluminium, brom or other atoms. And depending on the, on the atoms which are used uh, for doping, we get a different color of the light. There, there are some other alternatives uh, as uh, uh, calcium sulfide or strontium sulfide, and barium sulfide. However, these materials uh, were more sensitive to moisture and uh, therefore the, the, the lifetimes of this devices uh, was rather shorter. Uh, in terms of the average particle size, most of the powder electronics and devices are based on particles of between the range of 5 to 
30 microns, which is an optimized range. And um, yeah, um, these devices uh, are quite stable. If we if we decrease the the particle size, they can get more luminance, but uh, they were reported to be less stable. And on the other hand, using bigger particles uh, make it uh, less flexible and also less efficient. There was also some work uh, reporting use of zinc sulfide nanoparticles, but uh, I'm not so sure that if that device uh, reported uh, in this work was uh, can be considered um, as a as a powder electroluminescence as it was a rather resembling to to diode uh, based device, but they 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 have reported uh, quite low. Uh, AC voltage of only 10 volts at 100 hertz, so it still might be a promising uh, way also to follow. And the electrodes materials are usually based on uh, the traditional uh, conductive uh, pastes, based on uh, aluminium, silver, or other metals, nan nanoparticles, or microparticles, or car carbon loaded inks. And uh, more importantly, the, the front electrode, which must be transparent, it has been for a long time uh, represented by ITO or other types of uh, conductive uh, oxides. However, these are uh, quite uh, fragile, so uh, the flexibility of devices based on these uh, crystals is quite limited, and therefore uh, during the past, uh, let's say, one or two decades, new materials were implemented, such as conductive polymers, P.PSS, graphene-based materials, carbon nanotubes, and silver nanowires, as I will show you also later. Uh, this is how it looked uh, like uh, in a microscope, uh, yeah, in a scanning electron microscope. Uh, as you can see, the full structure of the device have a, can have a thickness of up to 100 uh, microns. And uh, as I said before, the, the, the zinc sulfide particles are really large. They almost occupy, in some cases, the, the whole layer of the, of the luminescent material. So actually, it's a, it's a kind of uh, relatively thick device, but still remains flexibility. So what are the current uh, most recent developments uh, in the material science? in terms of this technology. One of the interesting works is uh, based on implementation of graphene. Uh, the, the, that device was fabricated by a rod coating technique and uh, the uh, usual fragile, as I mentioned, uh, conductive oxides were replaced by a transparent electrode based on a reduced graphene oxide, only 50 nanometers thick. And the dielectric material was replaced by a graphene oxide, which is the non-conductive uh, form of graphene. And the thickness was 10 to 35 microns. And these devices uh, resulted quite comparable to the devices based on uh, inorganic uh, uh, barium titanate particles. The maximum luminance of the device was 15 candles per square meter. Another work is uh, focusing on implementation of silver nanovirus in a stretchable polydimethyl sulfoxan matrix, which opens a completely new area of uh, stretchable flat uh, devices. Uh, apart from that, in that case, the device is also semi-transparent and can emit the light from the both sides, which makes it very uh, attractive for the possible future use as illumination source. And uh, that device was deposited uh, by spray gun. Uh, and um, yeah, the, the active light layer was pin coated and the device can be stretched up to 100% of its original size and the authors claim up to 200 or even more than 200 candelas per uh, square meter can be reached. 
Another work uh, discusses the implementation of carbon nanotubes as the transparent electrode material, in this, this case uh, in combination with uh, so-called zinc oxide whiskers, which further uh, in, um, improve the efficiency of the device. And the authors reached 16 scandalas per square meter and the device was made by spin coating. This is uh, um, another example of a high brightness uh, device, also based on uh, silver nanowires, uh, which was fabricated by Mayer rod coating. In this case, uh, the authors uh, dispersed the, the um, active materials in uh, epoxy resin. And uh, they tried also two different configuration. One is uh, the so-called top emission and uh, the other one is the bottom emission. They were able to construct the balls and I think the top resulted uh, more efficient. And this device was extremely uh, stable under bending conditions. After 1000 bending cycles, they could still maintain up to 88% of its um, initial luminance. And what is more impressive is that they reached up to almost 1000 candelas per square meter, which is a really promising result. Uh, this is another work uh, discussing the stretchable devices, uh, which are also patterned, as you can see and uh, the authors were also able to tune the color based on the different doping of the zinc sulfide. This device is again uh, based on uh, polyimetal sulfoxide to make it uh, flexible and the active layer was screen printed and uh, the electrodes were again made by silver nanowires deposited by spin coating and the, 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 the final luminance was up to 16 candles per square meter. So another very recent work is based on the improvement of the dielectric materials, uh, where the authors uh, used the, uh, the titanium barium uh, nanoparticles uh, doped with lantern and uh, they increased the performance uh, by four times after the doping uh, by, or by lantern, which is quite significant improvement. So as you can see, finally they reached uh, almost 60 candelas per square meter, which is uh, four times more than uh, the majority of the devices based on polydimethyl sulfoxide, which I have presented before. So that is also really interesting. And they also employ the screen printing technique, both for printing the dielectric and uh, active uh, zinc sulfide layer. And uh, the last or one of the last works which I want to, to discuss is a ultra conformable uh, AC powder electroluminescence based devices, which were fabricated by solution casting. And in this work, to improve the performance of the device, the authors were using a solvent-free ionic conductor of dick block copolymer, which was combined with uh, ions of lithium. And uh, finally, they were able to increase both the stretchability and the luminance. The stretchability can go up to very impressive 800% of its original dimension and the luminance uh, up to 450 candles per square meter. So that opens a completely new area of uh, ultra conformable and st stretchable devices emitting light and being also flat. Uh, this work is also very interesting and shows that uh, and not only light can be generated uh, at such a kind of devices, but uh, they can become also multifunctional. In this case, this device is able to emit light from the both sides. And not only that, uh, also he, it can emit a sound, I think up to 60 uh, decibels. And um, yeah, again, it was uh, fabricated by combination of spin coating and screen printing. 
employing silver nanowires as transparent electrodes. Uh, the key material to be able to emit sound was the piezoelectric uh, PVDF polymer. And uh, the maximum luminance was uh, up to 170 candles per square meter and very fair uh, luminous efficiency of 10 lumens per watt. And uh, apart from that, the authors also claim that uh, applying the mechanical force, uh, the light can be also generated uh, by the tribo electrical effect, which is discussed actually in another work where the authors uh, fabricated uh, a sort of luminescent textile, which can be self-powered by triboelectric uh, tribo effect. This device was barcoded. Again, the authors use uh, polydimethyl sulfoxide, sulfoxide to make it uh, stretchable. And uh, as the device is being stretched, uh, it gets charged. And as you can see, it can also emit light without the need of uh, any additional uh, source of current. So that is also very interesting uh, for the future application, uh, especially in uh, illumination in dark conditions. So what are the future challenges of this technology? As you could see, um, a lot of is being done uh, to make these devices stretchable. However, there is a still a lack of fully printed devices and the upscaling of such devices is needed. So that is still a challenge uh, to make them stretchable, transparent and printed at the same time. And uh, on the other hand, the luminance levels are sufficient uh, for um, illumination in dark conditions or, uh, or some indoor conditions. However, to be able to use these sources also in outdoor applications or uh, mobile applications, uh, we need to exceed the, the average luminance of 200 candles per square meter. And that is still challenging in terms of the material research and the developing of new, um, more efficient materials. Uh, and last but not least, the durability. Also, as I have mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, at higher luminances, it's quite difficult to maintain these devices uh, stable and durable over long periods of time. So also that is still that is ch still challenging to prevent uh, for them from degradation at a higher luminance levels. So that is actually all from my side, and uh, I I will I would uh, appreciate any uh, interests of. Uh, ideas which you which you might have to, to further improve these kind of devices and uh, if you have any questions just uh, ask now thank you nico for your nice presentation and we have two questions uh, Tema is asking uh, how can you increase the brightness of the ac other electroluminescence devices is it mm -hmm. increasing the density of dopants and or nanoparticles does different average particle size of the same dopants affect the color emitter? Uh, I'm not sure if I could hear you well, but uh, one of the questions was how can we increase the luminance by doping or the brightness of the of the devices <clears throat> by increasing the density of dopants or nanoparticles? You can increase the brightness. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, I think uh, playing with the with the amount of doping and uh, the let's say the nature of the crystals, uh, it might be improved. How, however, I think a lot of uh, work uh, has been done in this uh, area. So I suppose that uh, in terms of doping and uh, let's say the optimization of uh, doping quantities and uh, the possibilities of which atoms can be used um might have been done a lot already okay and the average size of the particles affect the color um yeah that's a good question i think uh, it's rather the doping which atoms are used for the doping than the the size itself but let's say uh, the structure which is uh, typical and let's say in, in 
tens of microns uh, range that has been also optimized. So I think uh, it doesn't really change the color, but the color can be changed by uh, the applied frequency. Frequency. So uh, if you apply, uh, let's say I don't know, uh, 100 hertz or 1000 hertz, you can you can observe a slight change of color depending on that because you are actually exciting uh, a little bit different energy levels. Okay. Um, another question that we have is, uh, do you think a white light emitter or a chemical compound such as boron uh, dipyromethane, that is bodipi, can contribute to the uh, AC powder electroluminescence device? Uh, can you repeat the, the name of the material? Uh, the question is that if you think that a white light emitter or chemical compounds such as boron dipyromethane, that is the acronym is BODIPI, can contribute to uh, AC powder electroluminescence devices? Well, I, I can't really answer that question because I don't know that material, but uh, yeah, I, it's an interesting, uh, yeah, an interesting idea. Uh, we can study that. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, from Javier, and uh, he wants to know that what are the transparent electrodes in elastic displays? Are the uh, silver nanowire? Uh, I mean, the, the transparent electrodes, as I explained, uh, can be based on a, on a, uh, in the first place uh, on a conductive oxides which are uh, inorganic and uh, they are fragile. So I, I mean, if they are very thin, they have certain flexibility, but uh, still they can break after uh, bending. And uh, these materials then uh, in the last, let's say, decade were replaced by, by uh, different materials such as carbon-based materials, uh, conductive polymers, uh, graph graphene, based materials and uh, uh, yeah, silver nanowires, which uh, applied in a, in a stretchable polymers can be can be used to, to construct the transparent electrodes, which are also stretchable and flexible at the same time. OK, we have a lot of I the question by that. OK, Chema has another interesting question. Okay. Uh, can you control the sound that the AC powder electroluminescence device emits and what is the mechanism to produce that sound? Uh, I mean, the, the mechanism is based on the application of uh, the piezoelectric uh, polymer, which is the PVDF, which is used. Uh, and you can control the level of sound by applying uh, different levels of uh, of voltage uh, of electric field. Yeah, so you can you can control the intensity of the sound and light at the same time. Okay. If you, if you want to know the details, uh, I just uh, recommend to, to to check the the work which is which I'm citing at this slide. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Victor has a, a question. Uh, do you have some theory for optimization? Could you make some modeling before production of real product? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have seen works where the people make simulations and so on, and that is also quite useful and I think still uh, can be used to further uh, optimize these devices. It's definitely interesting uh, way of uh, continuing these, these developments. Okay, and I think that the last question uh, is from Javier. And can the electroluminescent material be mixed with the dielectric so that both materials are applied on a single printing step? Uh, yeah, it's possible. Uh, actually, the luminescent material is embedded in a dielectric matrix. Otherwise, the device would not work. But uh, it was it was shown just uh, at the beginning of the developments of this technology that it's better to separate uh, the let's say the the, the binder the electric binder uh, and the and the zinc uh, sulfide 
by forming another thick uh, layer of dielectric material, uh, which improves significantly the performance of the device. So in ba basically it's possible, but uh, then the device is less efficient. Also, uh, you, you lose some dielectric constant if you, if you mix everything together in one layer. Okay, thank you, Nico. I think that uh, we are going to finish here the seminar. Thanks to the attendees uh, for uh, for stay here with us in the seminar and uh, see you in the next one. You can find the video of this seminar e at the internet and also in our uh, YouTube channel, in the BC Materials YouTube channel. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye, Nico. Bye. bye.